Well, we're reading this morning from uh, John chapter 9. If you'll stand with me, I'm reading uh, John chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. I'm sorry, John chapter 4, beginning in verse 19. This is in the middle of the discussion between Jesus and the woman that he, Samaritan woman that he met at the well of Jacob, as you'll recall. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but you, the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's pray. Wow, that's a wonderful pronouncement that you made. I pray that as we try to understand a little more this morning what that really means, that you will guide our thoughts, give clarity to the expression of the truth of your word by your Holy Spirit and drive it into our hearts. Father, help your word to come alive and um, pray that it will make even more special this week when we remember you in a very special way. Thank you for the family and friends that most of us can anticipate celebrating with. We pray for those who have lost family, uh, those who have loved ones who have gone on, and so this is a bittersweet time of year for them. We pray that you will be a special comfort to them. Perhaps Christmas could take on a whole new meaning as they realize that the one thing that never changes is you. The one constant in life is you. What a wonderful privilege then to know you. So help us, Father, with our understanding both now and as we go through this week that it might be glorifying to you, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Christmas, I think most of us realize, has and is becoming increasingly more secularized. However, probably if you're here this morning, you realize that it originated really not as a consumer holiday, <laughs> but in celebration of the birth of someone called Jesus of Nazareth. The records of his life suggest that in the early hours and the first few days after his birth, there was great fuss around that, great excitement. But very shortly, he was spirited away by his parents to Egypt because an edict had gone out from Herod the Great, who was king at that time, that all the babies, at least in the Bethlehem area, should be killed, trying to get this one who he had heard something about was being called the king of the Jews. Upon Herod's death, Jesus' parents, of course, took him back to live in their home in Nazareth, and then we know almost nothing about him for the next many years. A little bit in Luke 2 about a trip to Jerusalem when he was 12 years old to the temple, and that's it. So that by the time he's 30 years of age, Jesus was basically a nobody, buried in a nothing town called Nazareth, working in an industry as a carpenter, having done absolutely nothing to separate himself from the mass of humanity by that time. So we might well ask why all the fuss about his birth. Well, we know that partly the answer to that question is that while he may have been obscure for the first 30 years, in the next three years, that obscure carpenter did more. Think about this. He did more to impact human history than any person who has ever lived by far. It's an indisputable fact the evidence of his impact and of his influence is absolutely everywhere. 
It's in every country. It's in every <clears throat> major religious faith. It's in every cultural medium from the highest of the art forms to the lowest form of profanity. Jesus is everywhere. You can't miss him. Someone has noted Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50, Aristotle for 40, and Jesus for only three. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left behind by the combined 130 years of teaching from these men who were among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. The historian H.G. Wells says this. He says, I'm an historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. So now you would say, no wonder there's a little bit of fuss about his birth, right? Even more to the point, I think, are the claims that Jesus made. Claims that were substantiated by the most incredibly authoritative teaching the most impressive display of miraculous power ever recorded in history. Thomas, or Joseph Parker, a, an old time preacher said this, he said only Christ could have conceived Christ. What he means by that is nobody could have made this up. Anybody who could have made up what is in the first four gospels of the, of the Bible would deserve to be worshiped as Christ, even if Christ never had existed. What is there is so positively amazing. The concepts that Jesus brought to the forefront of his time, the concepts of love, of humility, of compassion, of respect for the individual, of the power of forgiveness, were concepts that were absolutely unprecedented in his time. And they are the concepts that, if you think about it, are absolutely the foundation of our culture today. So even though, even though the belief in them, the belief in Christianity is crumbling, these values that Christianity brings to the table are still at the root of who we are as a people. Jesus' influence is everywhere. But Jesus' uniqueness extends even further. Houston Smith a great historian, claimed in his book, The World's Great Religions, that the two most dominant figures in all of human history, the two people who live lives of such beauty and influence and impact, that people didn't just ask, who are you, but they ask, what are you? Those two figures were Buddha and Jesus. But then he goes on, and he notes that while Judah consistently disdained worship, always said, absolutely, do not worship me, I am not God, Jesus did exactly the opposite. Jesus did exactly the opposite. There's no credible and figure in history who did what Jesus did when it, when it comes to that. A few insane people, but nobody credible. Jesus not only talked about being God, he staked a credible claim to be God. Another writer has noted, Buddha never claimed to be God. Moses never claimed to be Jehovah. Muhammad never claimed to be Allah, yet Jesus Christ claimed to be the true and living God. Buddha simply said, I am a teacher in search of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Confucius said, I never claimed to be holy. Jesus said, who convicts me of sin? Muhammad said, unless God throws his cloak of mercy over me, I have no hope. Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. He's unique in history, beloved. Make no mistake about it. Those kind of comments should stop us in our tracks when we think about who is it that we truly worship. No one else credibly claimed your eternal destiny rides on your relationship with me. 
but Jesus did. Jesus said, for this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. That's an astounding statement. Caesar never said, believe in me and get eternal life. Confucius never said, believe in me and get eternal life. Plato never said, believe in me and get eternal life. But Jesus did. So how do you, how do you get a handle on somebody who credibly makes that kind of claim on your eternal destiny? How do you look at him? How do you analyze him? How do you figure out who he is? Well, obviously, there are a lot of things we could say in answer to that question, but this morning, I want to look at just one. I want to look at the primary identity that Jesus staked out and claimed for himself. Most of you are aware that based on the Old Testament scriptures, the first century Palestinian Jews believed that they were expecting a great deliverer, someone that they referred to as a Messiah. Jesus claimed to be that person. So for example, in the passage we read this morning about the woman at the well, Jesus, she says, I know that Messiah is coming. And in 4 verse 26, Jesus answers, I who speak to you am he. This was Jesus' first public announcement that he was the Messiah. He made that claim. But, but now the question is, okay, so he claims to be Messiah. Who's Messiah? What is that all about? How should I understand that term? Did the Jews even have it right? What is that all about? Well, the Hebrew word for Messiah is Mashiach. It literally means the anointed one. The anointed one. Three offices in the Old Testament. The person had to be anointed to occupy that office. The office of prophet, the office of priest, and the office of king. That anointing represented the Holy Spirit's blessing on them. And Messiah was pictured, depicted as one who combined all three offices in one person, thus the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, Christos, the Greek word Christ really literally also means Messiah. Jesus specifically claimed that distinction early on in his ministry. One of his first sermons at his home in Nazareth, he read this passage from the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he God has anointed me. It's a messianic claim. That anointing specifically took place at the baptism of Christ. We read about it in Luke 3, verses 21 and 22, where it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. That's his anointing like a dove. And then it tells us that God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. This is my anointed one. This is the one. Jesus is without question from the biblical perspective, God's anointed one, God's Messiah. The question is, is he your Messiah? It's very important that he not just be God's Messiah, but that he be our Messiah as well. So to understand what does that mean, what does it mean for Jesus to be my, my Messiah? I want to look at these three offices that the Messiah incorporates. So first of all, we see that Christ is God's ultimate prophet as the anointed one, as the Messiah. He is God's ultimate prophet. Now, what did prophets do? Prophets spoke God's word to the people, right? Thus, thus saith the Lord was a staple of the comments that we find in the Old Testament. I don't know how many times, how many hundreds of times that statement is there. It's God's word being, be, being given through a prophet to the people. And so they speak God's word. We would never know, think about it this way, we would never know a transcendent other 
spirit being called God who is so far above us we could never understand him, see him in any way, sense him, unless he revealed himself. And he first reveals himself through words spoken by prophets. And his words, never mistake this, the words of God have power. They are living Ten times in Genesis 1 alone, we have the phrase, and God said, as he spoke the universe into existence. The word of God has power. The word of God is responsible for creating what we have. He's revealed himself, and he's revealed much about himself through the words of the Old Testament prophets and through his creation. But the ultimate word of God, is not a word of prophecy. The ultimate word of God is not a prophecy at all. It's a person. The ultimate word of God is a person. We find that, of course, in John 1.1, where John says, in the beginning was the word. Speaking of Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Prior to this, God's revelation had been through words. It is now through the word, the last, the final, the ultimate word of God's revelation to us as human beings is coming through the person of Christ. He's God in the flesh. He is God with us. He is Emmanuel. Jesus is God revealed in such a way that we can touch and taste and, 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 and feel and hear and see him. We can experience him. God is not hidden. God is not lost. Anybody who claims to be seeking God needs only to look to Christ to find him. It's bogus when people say, I'm going on a, you know, some kind of journey to find myself and to find God. God is right there in the person of Christ. He specifically sent his own son to reveal him. Hebrews 1.1, some of you are familiar with the passage. I'm sure you've been through it in Jesse's class already. Well, I hope so. It's the first verse. You've been there, right? <laughs> Hebrews 1.1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. This is a living word. It's the word of God. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the ultimate, beloved. Other prophets spoke for God. Jesus speaks as God. Other prophets reflected the glory of God, like Moses. Jesus is the glory of God. That's why John goes on in chapter 1 and verse 14 and says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word dwelt there. He came and dwelt with us. As the Word, literally it means tabernacled or tented. It refers the Jewish, referred the Jewish people immediately back to the Old Testament where the tabernacle that was built during Moses' time was what? It was the place where God met his people. He was, he was physically represented there by the cloud that was in the Holy of Holies, as you'll recall. God met his people in the tabernacle and he's saying, now I meet my people in a new place in Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate revelation of God. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Listen, God is known through the person of Jesus Christ. Anyone seeking God and rejecting Christ is nothing but a rebel. God has revealed himself. He's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself in words. And he's most of all revealed himself in his son. If we refuse him, believe me, beloved, the blame will be on us. As God's prophet, Jesus is the ultimate revealer 
of truth. Jesus told Pilate in John 19, verse 37, he said, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. Not to establish consumerism at Christmas time. Why was he born? I was born to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Listen, no one will ever be able to stand before God and say, truth is relative. <laughs> Let me inform you. Truth is relative. You had your truth, I had my truth. Let's agree to disagree and go away. Won't work that way. Jesus is the truth of God. Jesus not only spoke the truth, Jesus is the truth. He is the he is the truth. He, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. All of those does mean he's the ultimate in every one of those senses. Truth, way, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is God's final word. He is truth with a capital T. Jesus is extreme reality. Jesus is the only way to God. Larry King had a pastor on his show one night, pastor of one of the largest churches in America. If I said his name, you'd know him immediately. I worry about him. He asked this pastor, is, is it true that, that, that you have to know Jesus to go to heaven? He says, yes, yes. You, you, you come to heaven through Christ. And so King asked the natural question that every unbeliever is gonna ask, right? He said, well, what, what if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? And I took this down verbatim, so I want you to know this is what actually was said. Squirming, you know, visibly uncomfortable. Here's what that pastor said. He said, well, you know, I'm very careful about saying who would and who would not go to heaven. I don't know. I can agree with that because I can't see somebody's heart. But then he, King went on. He said, well, if you believe that you have to believe in Christ, they are wrong, aren't they? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that they are wrong. I, I, I don't know all about their religion, but I know that they love God. I don't know. They seem so sincere. I, I don't know. I cringed. How can you miss the chance to say Jesus is the only way? Is it true that just being sincere is all it takes? Vince Lombardi was sincere when he had a problem inside of his body and he thought, no, I'm just tired and he would not go get the exam that everybody urged him to get and so he died of colon cancer at the age of 57, something that could have easily been cured. Was it easy? Was it good enough just to be sincere? The issue isn't sincerity, beloved. The issue is truth. What is true and Jesus claims to be the truth of God. Reject Jesus and you've rejected God's anointed and final revelation. <laughs> there is no heaven without him. There is no life without him. There's no way to God without him. Jesus is God's anointed prophet. Secondly, Christ is God's ultimate priest. Christ is God's ultimate priest. This is really the one, this is, you know, this is the place where I think the wonder and the glory of Jesus really shine through. It's in this role as priest that he makes a substitutionary atonement for sin. And the, and this, and the offering that he makes is himself. He is both priest and offering. See, from the, from the moment that sin entered the world, God began to teach immediately that human offense against an infinite God requires a substitutionary sacrifice. It's the only way it can be remedied. It's the only way the problem of sin can be taken away. And so, in that very first instance in the Garden of Eden, God provided a substitute for the fig leaves that Adam and Eve clothed themselves with. 
When God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah, God, as Abraham was just about to kill his son, God provided a substitute. When the Passover came and all the firstborn in Egypt were going to be killed, God provided a substitute lamb so that those who by faith would put the blood on the doorstep would be saved. When God gave the law, summarized in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, which everyone realized nobody could actually keep, God provided a substitute lamb so that when it became clear that the Israelites could not keep the law, they could have a way to be forgiven through the lamb. There was a substitute. God is teaching substitutionary atonement all the way through the Old Testament. There must be a substitute. But there was a problem with those substitutes in the Old Testament. What was the problem? Hebrews 10.4 tells us, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They were deficient. They were not good enough to actually remove guilt. They were insufficient to erase sin. So what was the point of all those sacrifices? It was this, beloved. It was because they provided forgiveness on credit. They provided forgiveness on credit. Those who brought the sacrifice, their faith was not in the lamb, but in what the lamb represented. Just like when you go to the, you know, when, when, when you go out for dinner today, you guys are taking your wives out for dinner today, right? When you go out for, for lunch today, you're going to lay down your credit card, right? And, and, the, and, the, and the cafe is going to look at it and they're going to say, wow, where'd you get this beat up thing? What is that supposed to do? Is that what they're going to do? No, they're going to take it and they're going to let you go. Why? Because, because your credit card is worth anything? It's not, it's not only not worth anything, you're going to take it with you, right? But it's because it promises something. It promises that a reality is coming. It promises that the money is out there. That's what the lambs did. The lambs promised that the real thing is coming. And Jesus is basically saying, I'm the real thing. It isn't Coke. It's Jesus. He's the real thing. After hundreds of years and millions of sacrifices, John the Baptist looked up one day when he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. He pointed to the carpenter with his you know, husky hands that were, I'm sure you could see were rough from the labor that he'd been doing, looked just like anybody else. But John looked at him and he said, there's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How can you not hear those words and be thrilled to the center of your being? He was the end of the promise of all those lambs that had come before. Hebrews 10 verse 11 says it this way. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He is the sacrifice for sin. He is God's priest. He is God's ultimate priest who paid the ultimate price for the sin of everyone who will believe. Not on credit now, but in reality. The price has been paid. We've seen how Elijah and Moses joined Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke 9. Remember that, how they came down? And all they were talking about wasn't what they did in the Old Testament. It wasn't about the miracles. It wasn't about anything except the exodus that Jesus was about to do. The exodus meaning what? His death. Why was that important to them? Because they were in heaven on credit. The price had to be paid finally and actually, and it was in the person of Christ. That's why they were interested in what was going on. At the cross, God the Father wrote, paid in full. Whatever your sin, whatever your past, whatever it's been in your life, you come to Christ and it's paid in full. Substitutionary atonement is the only means of forgiveness. 
In the 1970s, there was a, in New York City, a psychologist named Helen Schumann, and she, I wouldn't know her, but she wrote a book, an atheist. She wrote a book called A Course in Miracles. In that book, she said this. She claimed that Jesus had appeared to her. This is an atheist, remember. But Jesus had appeared to her, saying, do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. Your only calling here is to devote yourself with active willingness to the denial of guilt in all its forms. I don't know a better statement of the difference between the way the world looks at guilt and the way that the Bible looks at it. What's the world's solution to guilt? Deny it. Deny your guilt. But beloved, it, it doesn't work. It will always reemerge. Why? Because guilt is real. If guilt weren't real, perhaps. But guilt is real, most of it. And so it will always reemerge. It's like the potholes in the Colorado roads, right? They come right back. You can fill them up all you want. They come back. Guilt comes back because it's real. Denying it will not work. That's why the celebrities who have the money spend year after year after year after year in therapy. Because that denial will not take away the guilt. So what does? What takes away the guilt of sin? Confession. Repentance. It's the only thing. To the only one who can forgive it, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The beauty of Jesus' priestly ministry is, most, is best, I think, summarized in 2 Corinthians 5.21. You've probably picked up by now. It's one of my favorite Verses in the Bible, if you don't know it, you should. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He, God the Father, made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. That's a beautiful verse. That's the way you take care of guilt. That's the way you take care of the sin problem. Jesus, in Luke 24, verse 47, specifically says that he died and rose again, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed, not deny, repent. That's how you get rid of sin. That's how you get clean on the inside. If your septic tank broke, leaked, what would you do, deny it? Or would you call some help to come and clean it up? See that we have the guilt of sin which is inside us like a great, great sewage overflowing our lives. And the only way to get rid of it, beloved, is not to deny it, it's to repent. There's a, there's an, in the art, there's a great art museum in Munich, Germany. In there, there's a, there's a wonderful, one of Rembrandt's greatest paintings, I think, called Raising the Cross. In this painting... It shows a picture of Christ front and center be, having been nailed to a cross and now the Roman soldiers are picking up the cross to hoist it into place in the, so that it will stand up with Christ on it. But at the foot of Jesus, there's another figure. He doesn't look like a first century figure. He's not dressed like a first century figure. He has on a, he has on a blue 17th century painter's beret, Rembrandt, has painted himself into the picture. It's a confession of his sinfulness and an acknowledgement that it is his sin which has sent Jesus to the cross. And so beautifully depicts the truth of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul tells Timothy, reminds Timothy, but there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, one go-between, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. But beloved, in order for Jesus to be my mediator, I have to paint myself into the picture by acknowledging myself to be a sinner, by acknowledging my helplessness, and by repenting of my sin. Have you painted yourself in? You painted yourself into the picture of the ultimate priest giving his life so that you could live God's ultimate priest. Finally, Christ is God's ultimate king. He's God's anointed king. 
History isn't going nowhere, it's going somewhere. It's going somewhere. May not look like it at any given moment, but it's going somewhere because Jesus came. Because Jesus came. Without Jesus, history is going nowhere. But because Jesus came, history is going somewhere. That tiny baby in the manger is going to one day rule the world. People don't believe that. I, I think a lot of Christians don't really believe that. But they will. Turn with me to the second psalm. You should be able to find psalms, right? Big book right in the middle of the Old Testament. Psalm 2. I want you to see how God looks sometimes on the folly of human existence. How aware he is, how patient he is. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we're not going to be hampered by any God. God knows that people mock. Beloved, that's not a, believe me, that's not news to God. He knows that people mock and shake their fist in his face because he does not immediately comply with their self-centered desires. God knows that. God knows that people think they can actively rebel or passively fob him off like yesterday's news. God knows that. God knows that the ultimate revelation that he has made of himself and the person of his son, Jesus, that he sent to die for our sins and to raise, be raised again, to sit at his right hand, God knows that people reject that. So what does God think of all that? Verse four. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Verse six says, for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will, that's God speaking. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Listen, don't forget Jesus was virgin born. He was begotten of God. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of earth your possession. Jesus is coming again as king of kings. That's where history is going for Jesus and his followers. The question is, where is your history going? Are you going to be part of his history? Is God's Messiah your Messiah? Is God's anointed king your anointed king? If you want him as your political king, he first of all has to be king of your heart. That was the message that Jesus had for the Pharisees all the way through the New Testament, and they could never get it or at least would not believe it. But this is why Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what it takes. He has to rule in your heart before he can rule as your king outwardly, as Christ the king arrived in your heart? That's the question. Do you know that he's there? He's done everything possible to make it happen. It's up to us now, right? It's up to us. We can go on our merry way. We can reject him. We can live whatever life we can make for ourselves apart from him, but we cannot make eternity apart from him. You can't do that. Because he's God's anointed. J.I. Packer says this, great theologian in England, the goal of the kingdom is the actual eliminating of all, listen to this, of, it's the eliminating of all active opposition to God's will and all disharmony caused by sin as well as the salvation of God's people. Toward this goal, 
really, if not always, in appearance, all things move continually under Christ's dominion. may not look like it, but this is where it's going. That's what he's saying. And then he says this, as God's Savior King, Jesus is, has absolute control over all creatures and an absolute claim upon men. No man has a right not to be his disciple. That's why there's a day coming, according to Paul in Philippians 2, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The only question is, will you do that now when it matters or will it be forced on you later when it's too late? Who is Jesus? He is God's anointed, his ultimate prophet, his ultimate priest, his ultimate king. Jesus, beloved, is God's final word. Jesus is God's final word. And after today, if you didn't know this, you'll never be able to say to the presence of God, I didn't know. You won't be able to say that. But it's not enough to know. It's not enough to believe the facts. The question is, is he your prophet, your priest, and your king? Is God's Messiah your Messiah? Because salvation is for those who have taken their hands off the wheel of life and given it over to God's Messiah, to the person of Jesus. Napoleon said this near the end of his life. He said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what foundation did we rest the creatures of our genius? Upon force. But Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of people would die for him. I die before my time, and my body will be given back to the earth to become food for the worms. Such is the fate of the great Napoleon. What an abyss between my deep misery and the eternal kingdom of the risen Christ, which is proclaimed, loved, adored, and still existing over the whole world. Are you part of his kingdom? Is God's Messiah your Messiah? I remember a t-shirt I saw at the beach one time. In front of the t-shirt said, I'm a slave for Christ. On the back it said, whose slave are you? The point being, we're all slaves to something. Why not choose to be the loved and beloved slave of God's anointed? Why not? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, your word. Lord, this is just one of many ways that we can look at who's that baby in the manger? What was all the fuss about? Why Christmas? But this seems so clear. You've revealed yourself in the person of your son. You've paid for our sins in the person of your son. And you have made possible an eternal life in his kingdom in the person of your son. How could we turn that down? Only, Father, if the enemy has us so blind that we can't see what is right in front of us. So I pray that right now you'll remove any blinders that exist that you will bring alive to us the reality of eternity and the reality of Jesus. I pray that anyone here, Lord, who has never done so would just in these moments even say in a little prayer to you, say, you know, you know what, God, I didn't understand this before, but, but I get it now. Thank you for coming to be my Savior and Lord, to be my Messiah. I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I fail you every day. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to cover every sin, past, present, future. I accept that gift of life. Come into my heart, I pray. Would you help us, Father, to do that if we've never done it? Lord, those of us who know you, help us as we go through this week to, to, to somehow make this front and center of our celebration 
that we might truly appreciate what God has done for us. That when we could not reach you, you reached us. For that, we thank you. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen.